All right. Well, good morning and welcome to St. Clair Baptist Church. It's good to, good to be with you this morning. We've uh, got several folks out for, for various reasons. So uh, remembering those that couldn't be with us today that would like to be. Um, and of course, just uh, being in prayer also for the contacts of folks that we have this week, that we'd be able to uh, be that light. Uh, that shining light out. I know our youth this morning uh, in Dicey's class uh, have certainly set a great example for how we are to be in church by thinking of others. Uh, it went with our adult Sunday school lesson this morning as we were talking. Paul was reminding us in Timothy uh, to pray for one another. Uh, all, you know, our neighbor, and so defining our neighbor is not our physical address. For some of us, that would be good. Some of us, maybe not so. Oh, good, but our neighbor is pretty much anybody we come in contact with, and uh, but our youth, I was saying the, the power of, of, of the youth, and especially our youth here, is really unmeasurable. It is the, the, the uh, examples that they set before us uh, each and every Sunday um, are just really inspiring, and, and we thank you, thank you for uh, what you've done this morning. So. All right, I hope everybody's had a good week. Uh, Mary, I seen your truck pull up, and I thought, no, Mary's already here, so <laughs> a little thrown off right there. Um, if you're visiting with us today, if you're with us on social media, uh, we're certainly glad that you have chosen to be part of St. Clair Baptist Church this morning. You are an encouragement to us, and uh, we, uh, we look forward to being that for you as well. All right, as we think about announcements, where's Brother Jim at? Does how you mind, is he saying about church council or... Five o'clock. All right, so five o'clock, church council uh, today, five o'clock this afternoon. Uh, we'll get together, and then I guess business meeting uh, probably after our evening service. The evening service will be at six o'clock. I remember Wednesday night, uh, seven o'clock. So I'd like to encourage everybody that can come out for that. Do we have any other announcements at this time? Amen, and safe travels, and Dicey's, so you know you hear about that glow that a, that a mother has, and Dicey's got it as a grandmother this morning. We were actually told in some training we can't tell people that in state government anymore, that they have a glow about them. Not grandmothers, that wasn't on there, so I can say that one. I can say, I can say it here if I want to. <laughs> That's just that much that some of us have to work for sometimes, right? We've got to be careful. I did want to tell Tim... Second Cracker Barrel conversation I had this morning, but all the Christmas stuff are out, you know, right now. So it's uh, really festive. There, it actually had. <laughs> it actually had in one section. You could look Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas <laughs> all together. Some of y'all are thinking, "Ooh, I wonder what they got out." So y'all are gonna go. So that's a good advertisement for them this morning. All right, what about birthdays last week? Anybody have a birthday last week? Get any younger? More wisdom acquired. All right. What about anniversaries? None of those either. All right. Well, at this time, I would invite anyone that uh, would to come up and read scripture for us this morning. Right out. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Anybody else? Kirk? Sir. First Peter four, seventeen through nineteen. The time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if righteousness is one scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good as a faithful Creator. All right. Thank you, Kirk. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Uh, I didn't get that. You're going to have to say that again, right? <laughs> Eric, are you listening? I'm going to brag on Alex. You know, this is the second Sunday in a row, but I'm going to brag on him one more time. He, uh, Alex had, or Callie had her freshman orientation this past week. 
And I was able to go with her to that. And one of the things the teacher told them to put down, um, our English teacher was put down some songs that kind of defined them or their life, whatnot. And so I don't know what Callie came up with. I've been too afraid to ask her what she might use. She's got quite a wide array of genre for music. No, actually, she don't listen to it a whole lot. Um, but she said when they resumed full class on Friday, the teacher was given an example of students in the past and lo and behold, Alex's name popped up, and it was amazing grace, and he reflected about the day he got saved. And, <laughs> whew, I mean, that's, uh, that's good stuff, man. That's good stuff. So, uh, and you wonder, uh, you know, last Sunday we was talking about his involvement with the uh, with those Christian Athletes Association there and all that, and uh, that God had put him in there to work with those young folks, and I was like, man, oh, Alex, you know, he's he's sharing it with us on Sunday, but he's doing it through the week too. And man, I'm telling you, Alex, you just can't believe what an encouragement those things are to us. And don't ever think of yourself as a kid that doesn't have an impact in church. And that goes for all of our youth out here. And uh, boy, boy, to hear that, man, you're talking about putting some lead in your pencil to go with the school system there. So anyway, but pray for our youth and, you know, pray for them to have that bold witness like that. And dare I say all of us to have a bold witness you know, like that. Uh, things that aren't always popular maybe in the school system, but uh, we're not going to shy away from it. All right. As we read through our prayer request, or as I do this morning, um, when, we, when I get done there, will be an opportunity to update anything we need to on our prayer list. I've got uh, Cody Isham, Thelma Wood, Johnny Mincy, uh, Praise uh, Tommy Stennett, Chester Ezell, Connor Roy, Brother Harold's Uncle Tommy and niece, Tina Peake, Pauline Brown, Joshua and Caleb, Mary Knipe's grandfather, Jim Neve, Cleet Vest, missionaries and persecuted Christians, Stephen Leonard Neve, Andrew Theobald for salvation, Pearl Lane and Kay Willis, Sharon Roundtree, Kathy Thompson, Heath Lightshaw, Denise Lightshaw with the upcoming scan, Eva Dunnigan, C.J. Smith, Mickey, his mom, sister, and crew, Latell Cunningham, Melissa Goins and parents, Dwayne Jenner's daughter, Dicey's granddaughter Ava, and we just heard a praise from uh, Dicey uh, for Miss Ava. <clears throat> Buddy Carraway, William Gibbons, April Atkins, Candy Latshaw's mom, uh, Jamie Wilson, and Connie had given us an update on her. Um, the uh, cancer being, uh, she's going to have to take chemo and just be in prayers for her treatments with that and the, and the type of cancer and all that that she has and be looking for God's hand to move in that situation. Uh, Gail Garrison's mom, Charlene Newby Greenoff, Beth Sherrill's dad, Hazel Henry, Mary Hill, Stanley Cunningham, Harold Goins, our unspokens. Remember uh, Jerry and Janet's grandson, Devin, who's going to be moving uh, to Memphis. Kurt's friend, Rudy. Uh, Janet Branscombe, who is home. And uh, also Leonard Waldo, Molly Duckett's mom, Liam Holland, Gary Harrison, Mildred Houston, J.D. Brockman. Kelsey Goins, uh, Melissa's uncle, Eddie Butler, family of Harvey Barrett, which is Mildred's brother, and the family of Carolyn Hunt, which is Amanda's aunt, Jim Talent, Sarah Francis Newby, Chase and Heather Watson with the birth of baby, um, Larry Reed with Parkinson and Salvation, uh, remember me with some upcoming shoulder procedures there, uh, Ukraine, Cindy Smith and parents, Janet Branscombe's great niece and also Jerry's mom, Earl Wright, Denise Lavender, our school and our school system, country and leaders, and then Beth Sherrill had uh, asked me this morning to remember them in prayer as today they're going to be celebrating, honoring, and honoring Dean's dad for 37 years of uh, ministry service that he's been in. And uh, so just be in prayer for all those that will be in attendance and also for that memorial service to go well for him. Uh, celebration. All right, what else do we have or any updates on our prayer list at this time? Mike, I'd yeah. like for you to add my granddaughter, Sandlin, and her husband, Basil, to the list. Uh, they have come in contact with a very serious disease. Okay, all right. So remembering that, and God knows all about it, so um, all right. 
Okay, what else? My prayer today, you can see, he, he's been named twice on Friday, there's something else going on. All right, so remember in Harold and... Um, We'll put Sue in there too because I know she's being that caregiver and she's playing that music for him and letting him uh, rest there too. So look forward to seeing Harold back soon. All right, what else? What day did you say? Tuesday. All right. You won't be able to get away with as much once he can see better. So. No, it's, it's just a spit and chat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else? Praying for sharing and all that goes with that. Okay. <coughs> all right. Dave, would you open us up this morning in prayer, please? Dear Lord, we'll tell them, Jamie, Father, we come before you again today. Lord, we thank you for the form of the Lord, our Lord and Savior. We thank you for all that you do for us on a continual basis. We thank you for the freedom that we still have to be able to show up this morning and worship you. We thank you, Lord, for this building. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the Blessings that you give us. We ask the Lord that you be with all those that are mentioned on the prayer list today. Father, we ask that we lift them up to you, Lord, and you see to the needs as only you can. And Lord, we pray that you just help us to understand the Michael teaching us in Sunday school this morning. Father, to pray for our neighbors, to lift them up to you, Lord, to look after them. Father, we ask that you just uh, help us to open our hearts and be still our minds as we prepare us, Lord, to receive this message. Oh, 
made me a little nervous there. I didn't know what he said to do to the choir. <laughs> Ray did an awesome job picking those songs out. I thought, man, we've got to get the ladies involved in one of these. And man, they shine like a diamond there. So I appreciate that. I was thinking about it. If somebody foreign to the gospel picked up the old red hymnal there and read through it and was like, I wonder what these folks sing about. And, uh, you know, as we sung this morning, talking about the freedom and the promises of God and the sweet by and by and all that, it would surely spark some curiosity and, and hopefully a yearning to do that. So we know the story behind the inspiration of those hymnals. So uh, as we sang and think about them this morning, let us be further inspired or re-inspired or whatever this morning and really sing from our heart there in excitement. But we sounded, uh, the whole church collectively certainly sounded good this morning. And uh, I know it's glorifying God in doing so. All right, do we have anybody that might have a song for us this morning? What about Melissa? What about Melissa? Yes. <laughs> I think you've been summoned to play for us. <laughs> well, I, I should say sing or play. So now, then, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she, she just said she didn't have a song for <laughs> All right, thank you, Melissa. I think that one was for you when she's talking about being on the firing line. So <laughs> that's a pretty good statement there, Melissa. Great job. Melissa, remind me of what your dad used to tell you when you was a little girl and you'd get up there and just rip and roar on that piano for the congregation. He'd, this ain't the place. He's, this ain't the place for that. Yeah, she got real fast and good on it. He'd be like, wait a minute, too much in that right there, little lady. But uh, yeah, we do appreciate Melissa uh, playing for us this morning. I'm thankful for Dicey to encourage her to get up there. All right, anybody else have a song or art race? Yeah, come on.
appreciate the Harrison family there and what a great reminder and still time to change what we'll leave behind for sure. Anybody else have a song? All right. Brother Jim. It is great to see you this morning and for us to be together again and uh, as we are together. Uh, Melissa, we appreciate you getting us off to a great start and great thought. You know, church ought to be a happy place. When we gather together, we ought to be happy. We ought to be excited about what God's doing. And uh, we need to remind ourselves of that quite often because sometimes we get in, uh, come in and we get caught in the uh, aspect of, you know, things are just down and out and all. And we ought to be excited about what God's doing within our lives, but what He's promised us. This morning, I want us to think on the subject, waiting for a crown. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians. Last week, we were in 2 Thessalonians. We're going to back up to 1 Thessalonians this week. But you know, as I was studying this, I began to look and see uh, what was taking place and uh, what they were preaching on in first century. You know, if you look through the scriptures, you find that Paul writes to Timothy, he writes to the church at Corinth, he writes to the church at uh, Philippians, and the church at Thessalon uh, the Thessalonians. And he reminds them mm -hmm. that they're, in a sense, are waiting for a crown. They're going to get something special because they follow Jesus. It's going to be a special time for them. Not only did Paul do that, but also Peter, and uh, we find out that uh, he also, and James, wrote about the crown. What are we waiting for? What are we looking for? Last week we set the background for uh, Thessalonians and talking about what was taking place. Reminder that this, these letters were the first probably two letters that Paul had written in his time. And it was a way of being able to lead the church when he was not there, when he was not present with them. Reminder that, you know, Paul had to leave pretty soon after he got to Thessalonica. Uh, the Jews turned against him and he had to uh, get out of town and uh, soon he pulled uh, also Silas and Timothy that were with him, pulled them out also. But when the Jews got rid of Paul, they, they weren't through per, uh, persecuting the church. They were after the church and after the people. And they began to spread the rumor around and said, you realize what Paul is doing. He's one of these traveling teachers. He's one of them that's only in it for money. He came in and he's trying to take your money. He's telling you stories that are not true. Uh, this business about Jesus, none of that's true. And so that was what was happening to the church there at Thessalonica. And Paul, as he hears word from him when he comes back to him, he finds that these early believers were holding to their faith. They were holding strong in it. And so he comes and he's writing to them and says, uh, you know, I'd like to follow it up with a visit, but right now I'm going to send you instructions how to stay strong in your faith, how to walk in that faith, how to live as Jesus called you to live. He said, remember, it's very important. To walk with your Lord. Over in First, first Thessalonians uh, verses 9 and 10, he writes to them, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. He's talking to him. He says, we're hearing that you had turned from the false gods around you, you've turned to the true God, and you're staying true to what we taught you. You're not being led astray by all the uh, stories that are going on, all the things they're trying to do to attack us. You're staying true and you're walking with us. And now you fully understand the promise of his return. 
Paul was trying to help them fully understand what it meant to stay true to the promises that Jesus had made, the difference it would make in their lives, the difference it would make in their future, what was all happening there. He said, do you realize the living God has come to live among you? He came as Jesus. He walked on earth. And He's come back in the Holy Spirit and He still lives among you. He's there. He affects you. He affects your heart. He affects what you do. Do you realize He was willing as God Himself to die on the cross for your sins? To come in and trade with you eternity and the promise of perfection for your sins. What a swap he made. What a difference he made. And what a message that Paul was trying to get across to a lost world. How does it impact us today? Those words that Paul was using promising this early church are the words that God promises us today. Walk with him. Live with him in what he's doing. Understand what he wants within our lives. Two or three things I want you to remember this morning. Number one, stick to your walk even when it's hard. That's what Paul is trying to uh, help the people there understand. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what was about to take place. Paul was called to be a missionary to the Gentile people. And you never anywhere hear him complain about that calling. It wasn't an easy calling. He tells you what happened to him, how many times he was beaten, how many times he was stoned, all the different things that happened to him. But he was never ashamed or he never complained about what God had asked him to do, what was going on. He accepted his role, no matter the risk, no matter the challenges, wherever he went. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, this is what he was telling me. He said, after being outrageously treated in Philippi, remember where he was there in prison, he, where he was beaten, all the things that happened to him, even though that happened to me, we were emboldened to come to Thessalonica to share the gospel with you in spite of the opposition. We knew the opposition was going to be there. We knew what was going to take place. But we wanted to be there because we had a message that can save you from an everlasting eternity in hell. He was trying to help them understand what he was bringing to them. And so he says, you know, when things get tough, stick to your wall. He reminded him. He said, even after we leave, you're going to still face persecution. But know this. Know the kingdom that I'm preaching to you is worth any persecution that you can ever face. It was an early reminder of what the church would face in our day and time. Across the world, Christians are being persecuted for their faith. In the United States, Christians are beginning to be persecuted for their faith. In a recent survey that was done, 60% of the believers believe that we will face, uh, they will face persecution within their lifetime for their faith in Jesus Christ. We ask ourselves sometimes, well, if that is true, why aren't we taking a stronger stand? mainly because about 40% of our nation today are Christian. We're in the minority in our world in which we live, in our nation in which we live. And so there's not enough to stand up for if you don't believe in persecution. If you remember, uh, after the decision the Supreme Court made, Roe versus Wade, who they attack? They attack the churches. They attack the uh, clinics were trying to help the people at that time. They attack, they attack the good because of the evil that lives within the hearts of so many today. That's a problem. 
if you have values and beliefs like Jesus, understand this, you will face persecution. There are going to be people that not like you. Why? Because the devil is real and around and he is alive and doing well. And his plan, if he can undermine the Christians, then he's got it his way for the time being. In every part of the world today, there is a price being paid for their faith. If we follow, if we live as call us to, we'll find that it'll come our way. No wonder Jesus spent time when James and John came to him and said, we want to sit on the right and left hand when you come into your kingdom. And he asked them, are you serious about what you're saying? Do you realize what you're asking for? If you sit on my right and left side, you're going to face persecution like you cannot imagine. Times have not changed. Times have not changed. So he's saying, stick to your wall, even when it's hard. Don't give up. Stay true. Because the other side of it is, when you're with Jesus, you're winning. He's already won. He's won the victory, and we are winners if we stick with Him. Second thing, you as a believer are to be a constant expression of Christ. We're His ambassador in a lost world. I did RAs for years, and their theme is we are ambassadors for Christ. You know what an ambassador is? An ambassador, as he goes out from a nation to another nation, he is a symbol of the people there. As they look at him, as they see him or her, whoever is there as ambassador, they're to see what the people of that nation are like. What they believe, what they understand, how they live. That's their purpose. You are an ambassador for Christ if you're a believer. In other words, as people see you, they're supposed to see what Jesus is like. What he does, what he's about, all the things there. The question is, are we there yet? Have we got to that point? What do people see us? As people see us, they should see God in us. But you know, as they watch us, if we have to do, if we have show our faith, then people look at us and say, well, there's not much to that Christian faith, is it? When things get tough, they fall by the wayside. I love the expression when they see the disciples in Jerusalem. As they saw them, they knew they had been with Jesus. They knew that there was something that had changed everything about them. Over in 1 Thessalonians 2.8, Paul was writing, We cared so much for you that we were pleased to share the gospel of God, but also our lives because you have become so dear to us. What's he saying? We as representatives of Jesus are not only to share the gospel with those around us, we share our lives. We live in such a way that people can see and understand we love you. We care about you. How much do you love lost people? How much do you love the people in our community that don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior? Be honest with you, sometimes we look at them and uh, we feel get so frustrated with them and say, well, you know, they don't really care why should I care? But that's not what Jesus taught us. He taught us to love them, to reach out to them, to care about them. And He taught us something else. He taught us to love our fellow believers. To love those that we're involved in. I remind you each time we're together, the power of the church is the fellowship, the love that you have for each other, the caring, the be able to reach out to lift them up when they need that help, when they need that comfort. But most of all, to help them that when we are in a good mood, in our good times, to
tell people we love them. Tell the people we care about them. This is important to them. Some people in looking at that have compared that love to the love that a mother bird, mother hen, whatever has for their chicks or their babies. They protect them with their very life. Nothing can separate them. And we as believers, nothing should be able to separate us from that love that we have through Jesus. You know, in the early church, the Jews had an idea. They decided that they could put Jesus in a box and get rid of him. You know, we buy everything this day and time in a box, our cereal, everything. You stick it in there and you know exactly what it looks like and it doesn't come out till you open it. They won't put Jesus in a box. They had a problem. The first thing they dealt with was they called him a revolutionary. There was a problem with that because he paid his taxes. He told them, render to Caesar what Caesar and no God. What is God? He told them even that when the soldiers commanded them to do something, not just go the one mile, but go two miles. He said, understand, you live in a world, we adapt and we do the things we can as long as we're following in God's will. And so that didn't work. And so they, they said, well, well, we'll get him on something else. See, he's just an old country carpenter. A carpenter can't know much. And then he sat there and he confounded and baffled the leaders of the day. The learned men couldn't deal with Jesus' knowledge of the Scripture. And that, that shocked them. And then the thing that really got to them was he was a Jew that even loved Gentiles. He reached out to them. Everything that they tried to box him in to say what was wrong with him fell apart because Jesus brought a love that nobody could fully understand. And that love is in you as a believer. How do you reflect it every day? How do you let it flow out of you to touch others and to make a difference? That's what we are as Christians. We're to love in such a way that people cannot deny that we've been with Jesus. As a believer, third thing that Paul's reminding them, you've got to invest in the life of others. You've got to reach out to them. It's the only way that you can make a difference in the world in which you live. All that you'll change, all that you'll leave behind is what you've changed for him. The early believers understood Jesus. They understood his investment in others. Barnabas invested in Paul after he had had his Damascus Road experience. He came in and invested in Paul's life. What did Paul do? He invested in Timothy and these other guys that were with him, out with him. And he changed and helped their lives. And on and on the gospel went. Now that's the secret of the spreading of the gospel. Who do you invest in? Who invested in you? Sometime back I sat down and looked at my life and I looked at who had invested in me. And I was amazed at the different things, the different things I do because of the investment of others in my life. Who are you investing in? Who are you making a difference in? had a uh, call this week from one of the uh, ladies I worked with, and she was telling me about a doctor in Mississippi that was a friend of ours. He worked in disaster relief. He worked in missions. He loved to share his faith wherever he went. He was recognized and respected because of that love. He's just become head of the Mississippi Health Department. I wonder 
if they have a clue what they're getting into. He lives Jesus in all he does and everything about him. And it's because people invested in him and made a difference within his life. Who are you helping change today? Then Paul finally tells him, he says, obedience to God is an order. It's not an option we have. You realize that? It's not, our obedience is not an option. It was mandatory if we're going to live a righteous life. It was given to us by God. It's for every child of God. And so what happens if we fail? What happens if we fall apart in that? 1 Thessalonians 4, 2 and 3 says, You know what we've taught you. Your sanctification is God's will. You are to become like Jesus. That's what Paul's telling them. You're to be like him. You're to walk with him. When we decide that we're going to be a part of God's kingdom, we're going to follow Jesus, we can't be half-hearted. What did Jesus tell us? He said, if you're going to go with me, you've got to take up your own cross and follow me. Jesus' cross saved us, but we have a cross also, and that cross is to become like Jesus, to take it and live with it. Paul wrote it this way. He said, for me to live is Christ. My every action is to be like him. That faith is not for someone who decides to be an occasional follower of Jesus. It's for one who wants to be like Jesus. I can imagine Paul standing before his people as he preached to them and he said, guys, Jesus is coming and coming soon. They misunderstood that. But Jesus is coming and he's coming soon and a lot sooner for some of us and some of you because we're going to stand before him one day. But Paul said there's something else he's got for you. He's got a crown. Over in Revelation, John talks about them, the elders throwing their crowns before Jesus. He's got a crown for you as you walk for him, as you've done what he's called you to do. Are you ready for that crown? Has he got it polished up for you? Have you lived in your faith the way he wants you to? That's what Paul's telling the church at Thessalonica. Guys, it's time to get over halfway doing your faith. It's time to live out your faith and look like Jesus when people see you walking. Let's pray. Father, you sent Jesus into our world to change us, to make us different. Father, you, he came with a promise of salvation through faith in him. And Father, we believe that. We know the difference that it makes. But Father, we know that in a lost world, people have to see Jesus. And the way they see Jesus is through us. Father, help us to be like him, to walk like him, to love like him, to live like him in our day. Help us to follow him as we've committed to do. Father, I pray that you bless us this morning as we've had time together to look at these words from Paul that we remind ourselves again of your promise to us of eternity with you. And what a blessing, what a promise it is. Father, help us to understand that. I pray this morning that there's one here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. This would be the day they would pray and say, Lord, come into my heart. Take my sin away and let me walk with you. Lead me now, Lord Jesus, to be what you want me to be. Father, bless us during our time of invitation. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together.
you're attacking Jesus. Let people see it. They don't see all the things. As opposed to going to sick and she's got to go. Cheryl, we thank the Lord for this opportunity, Lord, that we can come together, Lord, and worship you, Lord. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would uh, take this message, Lord, to this way, Lord, uh, give us opportunity, Lord, to, to keep us seeing you through us, Lord. I just pray for both us and all, Lord. I just pray that you would take us to the meeting of the prayer of this, Lord. You just go through this week, Lord. We need you to praise the Lord for all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.